Hello and welcome into another episode of Locked on Wolves. Today on the show, previewing game two of the first round of the Western Conference Series between Phoenix and Minnesota. We'll talk about adjustments to expect from both teams on both ends of the floor. We'll also talk about potential lineup and rotation adjustments. How might the Wolves adjust to the adjustments that Phoenix may make in terms of lineup rotation? What about slow-mo's availability? Also, we'll look at the Western Conference playoff landscape overall. And we'll talk about NBA award finalists. It's all upcoming. Welcome in. You are Locked On Wolves. You are Locked On Timberwolves, your daily Minnesota Timberwolves podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Wolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Beacon. I'm the host of Locked On Wolves. Today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I'll admit it, I have a competitive side. Who doesn't? My competitive side is a big fan of Monopoly Go, the mobile hit twist on classic Monopoly. Join your friends and download Monopoly Go now, free on the App Store or Google Play. Happy Tuesday, everybody. Happy Timberwolves game day. Of course, game two of Wolves Suns. The first round series is this evening, a 6.30 central tip at Target Center. Today is effectively a preview of that. Of course, in a playoff series, it's really more about in the wake of what happened in game one, what adjustments could we expect each team to make, especially Phoenix, right? Coming off a 25 point loss. And then how might the Wolves counteract those adjustments? So uh, we'll kind of try and connect what we did on Monday's show with what to expect Tuesday night. I also want to talk rotations. We'll talk slow-mo. We'll talk Kyle Anderson's potential availability and also the Western Conference. Well, actually, overall, the NBA playoff landscape as well as uh, NBA award finalists that were announced on Sunday night. So lots to get to here today. First of all, a big thank you for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen every day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere. That includes YouTube as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. Wherever you like to listen to podcasts, you can find Lockdown Wolves. You can also watch on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app on both Roku and Amazon Fire TV. And you can follow on X at Lockdown T Wolves and also at B Beacon. That's with two B's, two E's, C-K-E-N. All right. Let's go ahead and jump in talking about adjustments to expect. So we talked a little bit on Monday's show about some of the things that worked decently well for Phoenix on offense. Now, they only scored 95 points. The Wolves did a great job on Devin Booker. They did a good job on Bradley Beal. Kevin Durant was really the only one that hurt the Wolves. And the only actions that we saw Phoenix run that really had any sort of um I guess, sustained success, which is even an aggressive way to put it. Besides Durant ISOs, right? Durant ISOs against Carl Anthony Towns were beneficial for Phoenix. But as we talked about Monday, it's a pick your poison situation and to throw a big body like Cat at Kevin Durant, you tip your cap if he shoots, what was it, 11 of 17, something like that, uh, in route to 30 plus on, on Saturday afternoon. Um, you tip your cap. It's Kevin Durant, right? He's a Hall of Famer. What you can't have is Devin Booker doing that to you. You can't, and you can't have two of those three guys doing that to you. Right. So you pick your poison and you just know that Jaden McDaniels, Nikki Alexander Walker, Anthony Edwards, they're going to lock up the other two guys and the big body on Kevin Durant's going to be your best shot. Right. The only like half court action that really worked was when they tried some empty corner, uh, pick and rolls and in, in the middle of the floor with the strong side, just completely empty, which limits the low man help the wolves can bring it. It, it, it clogs up Minnesota's rotations. Right. We saw them have a little bit of success. There was only like one play that Nurkic even got free on and had success. They're not worried about Nurkic popping. Drew Eubanks was a disaster at backup center in what he played like nine minutes. So all that to say, this leads me to think, I, I mean, I mean, what? Let, let's look at the minutes here. Nurkic played 27 minutes. Eubanks played nine minutes, which means I'm pretty sure they didn't floor, play the, share the floor together at all, which means they played 12 minutes. Nurkic at 27 and Eubanks at nine. So that's 36 minutes. They played 12 minutes with Durant as a small ball five. And Durant overall had the worst plus minus of the game as a minus 20. Those Durant at the five minutes that were so successful in the regular season in three tries against Minnesota were the opposite in game one. Now, what's the true answer, right? Like what, what can we expect? What can Phoenix expect? Will they go more to small ball five lineups? I think they will. And the reason I think that is because they don't have a better option. Nurkic, if he's playing well, can give the Wolves some trouble, especially in the offensive glass, but he's not mobile enough 
to defend on the perimeter with the Wolves put him, you know, in actions on on the other end of the floor. And offensively, he's just a little bit limited enough. The Wolves aren't worried about him, you know, stretching the floor. They're not super worried about him in the mid-range. They're happy to give up mid-range jumpers. Of course, they'd rather have Nurkic shooting mid-range jumpers than Durant or Beal or Booker. So the uh, like and also even when Nurkic is playing, the Suns are at a massive size disadvantage anyway with Durant at the four. And nobody on that team being a plus rebounder beside Nurkic. Uh, the Timberwolves, or excuse me, Phoenix is at a massive size disadvantage anyway. So why not lean all the way into it and get your best offensive lineup out there if you're Phoenix, especially if you get down early. And that's kind of what happened in this game was they were trying to play catch up. So their most lethal offensive lineup was to put Durant at the five and just hope you make a bunch of shots to get yourself back into the game. I think we may see more of that in this game. And while the Wolves struggle with it in the regular season, they should be able to punish it on the glass as they did in this game. Minnesota out-rebounded uh, Phoenix 52-28, to 28, so a plus 24 advantage on the glass in this game. 13 offensive rebounds. Phoenix only managed three offensive rebounds in this game. And Minnesota should be able to punish that small lineup, especially on the glass. Uh, Phoenix isn't trying to score in the paint anyway, which is one of the reasons I was a little bit worried about Gobert's impact on this series. Obviously, it had a big impact in game one. Um, but on the other end of the floor, the Timberwolves should be able to get whatever they want in pick and roll game, whether it's Cat or Nas or, um, or, or Rudy Gobert. Gobert diving to the rim, the only hope the Suns have is to foul him, which they did a little bit in the second half of Saturday's game. And, and of course, Gobert made his free throws to the tune of six of seven at the charity strap. It's not going to keep teams from following him. And I, I get it, but that's a winning proposition for Minnesota. Phoenix continues to play more minutes small with Durant at the five, which I expect them to do. The Wolves should be able to punish it in the paint on the glass, et cetera. And the main reason I explained Nurkic is, you know, the pick your poison in, in a good way for Minnesota. You'd rather have Nurkic shooting those shots than anyone else. And Nurkic is less mobile. Eubanks is worse, right? You can't play Eubanks. And so by necessity, Phoenix is going to play small that much more often. And that's what I would expect in game two is just more small minutes from Phoenix and Minnesota having the ability to do whatever they want offensively. Um, it also allows Phoenix to just shoot more threes at which Phoenix needs to do. Like that's another adjustment. That's, that's not like a, a fancy X's and O's adjustment. It's math. And I mean, the Wolves shot Actually, only four more threes than Phoenix in this game. They made three more threes than Phoenix. And even though Phoenix had a free th had an edge of the free throw line, at least in terms of attempts, they were a plus three free throw attempt wise at the line. The Wolves more than erased that by shooting more three pointers and making more three pointers. So another way for Phoenix to do that, to attempt more threes, is to play a smaller lineup where everyone on the floor is going to shoot threes, right? If Durant's at the five and you're surrounding him with Beal Booker, uh, you know, probably Grayson Allen, depending on his availability, and you know, Royce O'Neal and maybe Eric Gordon. Like that, everybody out there can shoot threes, right? And and it's it's amazing to me that they don't manage to shoot more. Now, obviously, it's because Durant is one of the best mid range jump shooters of all time. Booker is one of the best of this generation, and Beal's no slouch from from mid range either. And they're happy to do it. The Wolves are more than happy to allow them to shoot contested mid range jumpers. Um, I want to talk about a couple of rotation things. We'll talk about slow mo and whether or not he plays and what impact that might have. And and you know, my one concern with him. You know, he only played five minutes before he went down with the hip injury in game one. Why I'm a little bit worried about his potential return to the court. Don't get me wrong. I hope he's available as an option. And obviously, I hope he's not hurt. Like, I hope he's obviously he's hurt, but I hope he's not out due to injury. But there's the slow-mo presence thing combined with the, the son's ability and willingness to go small worries me just a little bit. So we'll talk about that next. We'll talk about a couple things I think the Wolves should do a little bit more offensively themselves. I know they scored 120 in the first game, but... Uh, that, you know, offense is still a thing. There's still a lot of room for growth there, as we know. So we'll talk about that next. We'll also talk about the bigger NBA landscape uh, here moving forward. And uh, we'll do all that here next. Today's episode of Lockdown Wolves is brought to us by our friends over at Prize Picks. Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. It's the easiest and most exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less on two or more player stats 
and watch your winnings roll in. You can get in on the playoff action, win up to 100 times your money on prize picks as you and the world's best players take the game to a new level during basketball's postseason. You can now win up to 100 times your money on prize picks with as little as four correct picks. You can turn 10 bucks into $1,000 with basketball and hockey entries today on prize picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. You can also play alongside some of Prize Picks' favorite players like Meek Mill, Sugar Sean O'Malley, and more. You can find community plays under the Promotes tab of the app to view entries from some of the biggest names in the Prize Picks community each and every week. Download the app today and use the code LOCKDOWNNBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, that's the app, the Prize Picks app, the code LOCKDOWNNBA, L O C K E D O N N B A, for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Do you watch Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? If so, no doubt you have to turn down the volume with all the shouting. I know I do. Make the switch to Locked On Sports today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, a couple of rotation notes here. So Kyle Anderson practiced on Monday and is listed as questionable. Um, It certainly seems like it's likely he's available. I predicted as part of my bold prediction segment on Friday show, which side note, if you missed Monday, I tooted my own horn a little bit by talking about my near hit in the very first game on a bold prediction. I said, Nikhil Alexander Walker would score 20 plus in a Wolves win in the series. He had 18 and the Wolves, of course, one going away on Saturday. He had a three that would have bumped him to 21 that he missed late in the fourth quarter. Um, anyway, one of my other ones was that Kyle Anderson may get played off the floor as in he becomes the half or the or a zero in the Wolves' seven and a half to eight man rotation, expecting obviously the the regular starting lineup, expecting Nas Reed and Nikhil Alexander Walker as your seven, your eighth guy is some combination of Kyle Anderson, Monte Morris, Jordan McLaughlin, and McLaughlin wasn't in the rotation in this game. Monte Morris only played about ten minutes that were non garbage time, nine minutes that were non garbage time. So, um, all that to say, uh. Kyle Anderson's presence, what makes me a little bit nervous is that he's best deployed as a small ball five or a four, which is also kind of inherently in a small lineup, right? One of my concerns coming into the season period way back in the fall was that Kyle Anderson was so effective at the four last year for Minnesota, arguably the best season of his career, certainly the best shooting year of his career last year with the cat injury, uh, you know, slow-mo played a lot at the four. This year, he was being asked to bump down to the three because of the Nas contract and a healthy Carl Anthony Towns. So you're talking you know, what, three quarters, 80% of his minutes came at the three this year. We did see him struggle, obviously, with his shot. But beyond that, he just was never really comfortable. Certainly more comfortable after the trade deadline. That's well documented. Uh, But I worried a little bit about him getting bumped onto the three more in this series just to get him on the floor more often. Um, And if the Suns are going to play small, you can't play Kyle Anderson at the three, which means you're going to be at least playing him at the four. And you may be tempted to play him at the five if you're Chris Finch. I don't think Finch will do that because if you're playing him at the five, that means... Nas, Cat, and Rudy aren't on the floor, who are three of your best seven players, three of your best six players, probably. Uh, so, and two of your best three players. So I don't think Kyle Anderson is going to play the five, but it it could be, it could tempt Chris Finch to do it. And if nothing else, it means Kyle Anderson's likely to be on the floor at the as the four, because otherwise he's not in the rotation, which is one of the reasons why I predicted there could be a moment in the series where slow is just not in the rotation. And of course, I'm not saying due to injury, Maybe this is the game where you try it. I guess you kind of got to try it in game one because of the injury. He only played five minutes of the first half. But maybe you rest him for a game and see how you do without slow-mo in the rotation. Make sure he's all the way healthy. He gets ends up getting six days off before they play again on Friday. It's another two-day, two-off-day gap, the only other one of the series, with both Wednesday and Thursday off before they play again Friday night in Phoenix. So you could just kind of say, hey, let's go it without slow-mo. Let's always have two of Cat, Rudy, and Nas Reed on the floor together and your three is going to be Jaden McDaniels more often than not. Sometimes you have Ant, Nikhil, Alexander Walker and Conley or Monte Morris on the floor together. That's fine. Um, But slow-mo at the three is not a winning proposition in this series. And I understand that he can check Kevin Durant. He's another big body similar to Carl Anthony Towns in that regard. Uh, I I actually think at this point they're pretty similar one-on-one defenders. I don't know that slow-mo is all that much better than Cat. 
uh, you know, against guys that are quicker anyway. Um, they're, you know, they're both solid team defenders. You may give slow-mo the, the advantage there in terms of his all around team defense, his help defense, his awareness, et cetera, probably still a little bit better than cap, but one-on-one, I don't know that he's any better. And he's obviously, you know, the far inferior offensive player to Carl Anthony Towns. So I worry a little bit about integrating slow-mo into the rotation in this, in this matchup. I just, it's just a bad matchup for Kyle Anderson. And I get that he can initiate offense. And when this offense is stagnant and not moving well, and not functioning well at all, not playing efficiently, not moving the ball like they need to, you can try and give yourself an injection of slow-mo, but you're also then reducing the number of shooters on the floor. And Phoenix is goading slow-mo into these nine-foot weird little half fall away jumpers, as we've seen them do often. And we've seen slow-mo have these, these stretches where he just can't make them. Um, and the other thing that that does is, well, well, let me say it a different way. There's other guys that could do that, right? When Anthony Edwards is going, well, obviously you want him initiated and you want Mike Conley. You could have Morris or McLaughlin and also Nikhil Alexander Walker ran some point in game one. So I, I just don't know that there's much of a role for slow-mo now, assuming they advance, I shouldn't say assuming they advance if they advance the second round and say they're playing Denver in the second round, slow-mo is a better fit for that matchup. I think there's, uh, a world in which slow-mo can be more effective than in this matchup. I just worry about, um, and, and I talked a little bit about this, I think on Friday's show, I understand the argument and maybe a little bit on Monday. I understand why people think slow-mo would be valuable, but I, I disagree. I think it's, I think this series is tough for Kyle Anderson. Uh, one other thing I think the Wolves should do more of is play more in transition and they won the transition battle. I think they won fast break points, 13 to 10 in game one, um, but they can do more. And I talked on Monday about Anthony Edwards get hitting a couple mid range jumpers in in transition in the secondary break and kind of broken floor situations before the defense was set. And Ant said after the game that seeing those mid range jumpers go in and 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 finding the range helped him with his confidence and ultimately the result of his three point shooting later in the game because he he was just more comfortable. Right, that's big for Ant to hit a couple of those mid rangers to get to the line maybe get to the basket um, and, and force the issue in in transition and also some trail threes in transition too for both Ant and Carl Anthony Towns. So getting out in transition and running is going to be super important and related playing more through Carl Anthony Towns. And I know they, they actually think I, I don't want, I don't say this because, because I don't think they did a good job in game one with this. I just think they could do it even more in game two because the Suns aren't, I don't think they're going to go away from loading up on Ant. They're going to say, all right, you got us once with, with getting off the ball, making quick decisions in the half court. Let's see. Let's call your bluff. Let's see if you can do it two games in a row, Anthony Edwards. And I, I think the answer is yes. But either way, Carl Anthony Towns, the Wolves did a great job running offense through him. He ended up with eight free throw attempts. Kevin Durant struggled to guard him. He drew. He had an and one on Kevin Durant, a really strong possession offensively for Carl Anthony Towns. He played a little more in the mid post than I expected. I'd like him more in the low block, which is where he got the and one on, on KD. Um, and I wouldn't mind seeing him at the nail a little bit. And, and they didn't really do that in game one. I expected them to. So we'll see if they mix that up at, or mix that in at all. It obviously is much more difficult to double team him from there. And he doesn't necessarily need to go as quickly. Um, but we did see him make relatively quick decisions when he was in the mid post and the low post in this game. And just more offense running through Cat. The trail three that he took in transition, I think it was the Wolves, actually their first offensive possession that he missed. Jaden McDaniels got the rebound and the putback and, and it put the Wolves up 2 nothing at the start of the game. Those types of shots are big for Carl Anthony Towns. And if he hits those, the floodgates may open for him from outside the arc. And if that's happening, then it's over for the Suns. Like if Cat's knocking down trail threes and just feeling confident enough to just let it fly when it touches his hands outside the arc, um, now you're playing him to shoot and then he blows by you and he scores. Uh, you know, off the dribble and he's drawing fouls and he's, he's, you know, if he's going well, that he can kick it to the corners and, and get your, get your defense in a rotation and try and find an open shot for a teammate as well. So I just think a couple of those trail threes for cat, a couple of those semi open threes that he can hit early in the shot clock or in open floor situations are going to be really big for Minnesota's offense and for cat individually. All right. I want to put a bow on that real quick. And then talk more broad NBA, I guess, uh, I guess NBA playoffs to this point, uh, you know, game and a half 
call it on average through the first round series. And then also words finalists that were announced on Sunday. No surprises for Wolves players that will be finalists or are finalists, but we'll run down those real quick as well. So a few more things here to go uh, coming up here next. Today's episode of Lockdown Wolves is brought to us by our friends at BetterHelp. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Sometimes we need the opportunity to get something off our chest. Big or small, certain things can really start to get to you. It's important to let that out, especially to someone who's unbiased on your life. Today, I'm going to tell you how I really feel about something. You might even be thinking about the same thing this week, speaking of NBA awards. And that is that Chris Finch is not being considered a, a, a I don't want to say the favorite, but like the odds aren't better for him to win coach of the year over Mark Dagno from the Thunder. And I understand the argument for Dagno. I'm even okay with him being the favorite. But for there to be such a big gap in odds between Dagno and Finch is really surprising to me. I know the Thunder have an extremely young team, but they've also got SGA, who's one of the best five, six players in the entire NBA. And it's hard to argue he's a top 10 player right now. He's probably top 15. But most people, we just saw the NBA survey. Actually, this could, I also could gripe about this. The NBA player survey came out on Monday and Rudy Gobert again was voted the league's most overrated player by other players. He wasn't number one last year, but he was a couple of years ago. Over 13% of the vote or 100 plus NBA players said Rudy Gobert, uh, over 13% of the 100 plus surveyed that responded to the survey said Gobert is the most overrated player. So, you know, you have Ant as a top 15 player. Nobody's going to say Cat or Gobert are top 20 players now, maybe 25. Cat was an all-star this year. But why is Chris Finch not getting more credit to go from 42 to 56 wins, to go from a team that people said, why are you playing big, to being first in the West for most of the season? He should be getting more love for the season that he just coached for the Timberwolves. Look, therapy looks different for everyone, and many people have bigger problems than complaining about coach of the year odds. But... Regardless, it's important to get things off your chest every once in a while. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. Visit BetterHelp.com slash NBA to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash NBA. Today's episode is also brought to us by our friends over at Monopoly Go. We've all been there either as a player or fan. It's halftime. The scoreboard is not looking good. You're feeling low. Not sure you or your team can pull out a win. And that's when you dig deep. Lift your head up and say to yourself, time to get back in the game. Pull off some bank heists and take as much of my friend's money as I possibly can. That's right. The smash hit mobile game Monopoly Go lets you compete with your friends to get the most riches and the biggest empire. It's the Monopoly you love, but on your phone anytime with tons of new twists, including leaderboards to compare your progress to your buddies. There's so much to do. Play on countless dynamic Monopoly boards. Make your friends bankrupt by smashing their landmarks with a wrecking ball. Charge other players rent for your iconic properties and more. You can even work with your friends to crack open community chests and in tournaments to get extra rewards and climb the leaderboard. So get back out there, put on your game face, and download Monopoly Go, now free on the App Store or Google Play. Okay, so putting a bow on expected adjustments for this series. I'm expecting the Suns to play more than 12 minutes with Durant at the 5 in Game 2, and I'm expecting Drew Eubanks to maybe not even play at all. I'm expecting Minnesota to dominate that in the paint, and to basically roll out the same defense uh, on Minnesota, I think Minnesota will play the same defensively. I think the Wolves should play faster in transition, a little bit more through Carl Thitty Towns. And I'm dubious about Slobo reintegrated into the series with, with any minutes, certainly not at the three, but his minutes at the four. I worry a little bit about that too. So we'll see what the adjustments and the counter adjustments are as we move into game two. Sitting here right now, after play on Monday, recording this after Monday night's games, um, Man, in terms of the, I mean, the weekend, all eight home teams won game one, which is the first time that it happened in, I believe, 11 years. I think 2013 was the last time that happened, which is crazy. And that trend continued on Monday night. Cleveland beat Orlando by 10 in what is going to be just like, is anybody ever going to score over 100 in that series? The Knicks had that crazy comeback. Uh, what were they down? Five with like 35, 40 seconds left. And, uh, Hit, hit those threes to beat uh, Brunson and DiVincenzo hitting those threes, ultimately beating the Sixers. And then Denver coming back from 20 down in the third quarter to beat the Lakers on the Jamal Murray buzzer beater. 
I mean, those two games consecutively, Knicks, Sixers, and Nuggets, Lakers were insane. Um, insane. And if you're obviously, if you're the Sixers and you're the Lakers, letting those opportunities slip away when you have late leads in the Lakers case, a massive lead midway through the second half. And in the case of the Sixers, a multi-possession lead with under a minute to play. And you have a chance to even the series going back to your building. It's just such a big gut punch. And, uh, I wouldn't mind the same result on, on Tuesday night. Right. If, if, I mean, hopefully it doesn't come to that, but if it's going to be a close game if that happens to Phoenix, I mean, like you could, you could see just exactly how frustrating that would be. Um, over the weekend, nothing really shocking. Again, home teams won. OKC New Orleans was fun. That was low scoring, but less of a slog, at least. I mean, early the shot making was bad, but less of a slog than, say, uh, Magic Cavs was certainly. Um, no surprises in Boston, Miami. We'll see how Clippers and Mavs plays out. I think that'll end up being a close series. I think you're going to get great series from OKC New Orleans, uh, Clippers and Mavs, and I still think the Lakers win at least one in LA, and that should end up being a good series. Otherwise, Wolves-Phoenix is is one of the next best series. I think all four of those go at least, uh, I don't want to say at least six, certainly at least five. None of those will be sweeps. Um, Lakers Nuggets maybe won't, but I would say, I would say the other ones that I mentioned, you know, Pelicans Thunder and Wolves Suns and uh, possibly, uh, probably not Knicks Sixers anymore. Oh, Clippers Mavs. That's the other one. Those three will all go at least six games, I think. So um, we will see. I'm excited. I'm, I'm excited to see, like, I, there's some legit, I know that there aren't any tied series right now through, you know, one and a half games on average for these series. No, nothing, nothing's tied right now, but it's still going to be a ton of fun. And Monday night, I mean, if that's any indicator, actually from Sunday night, uh, Pell's Thunder through the games on Monday, some really, really good basketball. All right. Uh, awards finalists, no major surprises here. MVP finalists, Luka, SGA, and Jokic. Um, I might as well just kind of give my ballot here as I go down uh, go down the list. Well, I don't know. I guess I could do that. It won't take long. Uh, MVP, I go Jokic, SGA, Luka. Um, I, I, don't, I don't even think that I would have Luka third if I was doing my own ballot. I'm just going through the finalists here. Uh, Jokic is the best player in the league, and his team got the two seed. And, I mean, they missed. There were Murray games missing. The team's not as deep as they were last year. I think he's got to win MVP. I love SGA. I still think he's he's underrated. I just called him a top five or six player, uh, but I still would give it to Jokic. Six man, I think you got to give it to Nas Reed, and then Malik Bunk would be second, then Bobby Portis third. Defensive player of the year, Gobert, then Wembenyama, then Adebayo. Wembenyama may win it next year, but Gobert should win it this year. Most improved player, I'd go Kobe White. Um, I, I love Shangun, but... Uh, I don't know. Kobe White's Kobe White's the winner here. Maxi is just a volume thing more than anything else with the Embiid injury and some of the other stuff going on with the Sixers. Coach of the year. I understand why Dagno's the favorite. I would still say Dagno. I know I just talked got on a soapbox about it. I just think it's a closer race than people are really considering. Uh Dagno one, Finch two. I'd go Jamal Mosley three. Rookie of the year. Um I, it's got to be Wimbanyama, then Chet, then Brandon Miller. And Clutch Player of the Year, I don't even really want to speak to that, but I guess you'd go SGA, DeRozan, Curry. I mean, DeRozan only because the Bulls played so many close games. He's basically the only reason why they were even in the play in the first place because of how bad Levine was and some of the rest, uh, and then injured and, and you know that whole terrible Bulls season. Anyway, no surprises there with Nas, Finch, and Gobert being finalists in their respective categories. Uh, I would expect Gobert to win Defensive Player of the Year, and I I think I would expect Nas to win Sixth Man of the Year. I, I believe he's the favorite at FanDuel. Um, so those are my expectations. They're announced basically like I think starting later this week, consecutive days. Uh, they they announce the actual winner. So we'll keep an eye on that for sure. All right, that's all we got for you today. After the show Tuesday night, of course, there's a live postcast over on Lockdown Sports Minnesota. I believe it'll be Tyler. Metcalf joining Luke Inman on the show. I'll probably make a, an appearance either hosting or, or as the guest over the course of the playoffs here. Uh, probably even this week would be my guess. Um, so again, Lockdown Sports Minnesota, the live postcast immediately following the game. That audio comes up on the Lockdown Wolves audio feed as well. If you don't watch it live, it is a 6.30 p.m. tip though. So we'll do the live show about like, I don't know, 9.30 ish or whatever, um, shortly after the final horn. So it won't be too late on Tuesday. Friday is a different story. Um, so pay attention to, or, or subscribe, I guess, to, to help you pay attention to lockdown sports, Minnesota on YouTube and know when we're going live 
And then uh, Wednesday, of course, we'll have the post game pod here. If you can't watch the game live for whatever reason on Tuesday, make sure to check it out on Sirius XM on the SXM app. Just search Minnesota Tim rules. You'll catch Alan Horton, every bucket of Wolves sons on the SXM app. Again, just search Minnesota Tim rules on the SXM app and you'll find the, the, uh, the game on Sirius XM. All right, that's all we have for you today here on the show. A big thank you for making Locked On Wolves your first listen every day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere. That includes YouTube as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. Wherever you like to listen to podcasts, you can find Locked On Wolves. You can also watch on the Locked On Sports Minnesota app on both Roku and Amazon Fire TV. And you can follow on X at Locked On T Wolves and also at B Beacon with two B's, two E's, C K E N. Of course, the Locked On Wolves podcast is part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Remember, the Lockdown Network is your local experts on all the biggest stories. Once again, I'm Ben Beacon. This is the Lockdown Wolves podcast, and we'll catch you next time.